Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help support our work on Patreon if you can. We appreciate you. Sometimes, I like to drop back to the basics of rocket science, to make sure that we are all on the same page. When we study rockets, we often come across strange terms that we don't use in everyday life. Specific impulse, mass propellant flow, and delta V are some of these. The first two concepts are pretty easy to grasp. Specific impulse is a way to measure the efficiency of a rocket engine. You can start with metric or imperial, and you will get the same value in the end. Mass propellant flow may not be a familiar term, but we can intuitively understand that it's talking about the mass of propellant flowing through our rocket engine into the combustion chamber per second. Now let's look at delta V. Delta V is a very important concept when it comes to understanding spaceflight. A delta in physics usually means change, so when you hear delta V, think of change in velocity. In this case, we are talking about the total change in velocity. What was your rocket's velocity at one point in time, say after first stage burnout, called main engine cutoff or MECO, compared to your rocket's velocity at another point in time, say at second engine cutoff or SECO. Calculating this change in velocity gives you the delta V added by your second stage. This is not acceleration. Acceleration is the change in velocity over time. How fast did you make this change? If your rocket went from 100 meters per second to 200 meters per second, the delta V is 100 meters per second. If the rocket did this in one second, the acceleration is 100 meters per second squared, or about 10 g's. If the rocket made this change over 10 seconds, then the acceleration is only 10 meters per second squared, or about 1 g. The delta V doesn't change. Delta V doesn't care about the actual mass of your rocket. Let's consider going from Earth to low Earth orbit. This usually requires about 9,400 to 9,800 meters per second. Subtracting gravity drag and atmospheric drag, we can end up in space with an orbital velocity of about 7,800 meters per second. What orbital altitude would this give us? Here is the equation that gives us the orbital velocity. From knowing the gravitational constant and the mass of the Earth, we can rearrange this equation to calculate the radius of the orbit. The mass of the Earth doesn't really change much, and has a value of 5.9722 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. The gravitational constant doesn't change at all, and it is 6.6743 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Multiplying these gives us a pseudo constant we called mu. Mu is 3.9857 times 10 to the 14th power meters cubed over seconds squared. Putting this into our calculator, we get a radius of 6,551,653 meters. The Earth has an average radius of about 6,371 kilometers, which is 6,371,000 meters. This gives us an orbital altitude of about 180,653 meters, or about 180 kilometers. This puts us 80 kilometers above the Van Karman line. But what if we don't know the delta V of our rocket? What if we are looking at a methane burning rocket, like the Terran R? and we have incomplete data. This is planned to be a fully reusable rocket system. We know that this rocket is made by Relativity Space, and that this will be the world's first almost completely 3D printed rocket. It is 66 meters tall and 5.5 meters in diameter. We know that the first stage is powered by seven Eon-R engines, which produce a maximum combined thrust of 9,400 kilonewtons. I know I could say 9.4 meganewtons, but I prefer to keep with kilonewtons to make comparisons easier. The second stage will have one ion vac engine producing 126 kilonewtons. See, no one wanted me to say 0.126 meganewtons. The information here tells us that it can get 20,000 kilograms or 20 metric tons to low Earth orbit. This will beat the Falcon 9, with a limit right now of about 17 metric tons. Plus, the Falcon 9 must throw away its second stage, while the Terran R second stage will deploy its payload and then return for a vertical landing. But this data sheet does not tell us the mass of the rocket itself, much less the first and second stage mass. Let's see what we can figure out. If the maximum thrust of the first stage engines is 9,400 kilonewtons and the thrust to weight ratio is the usual 1.5, 
We can divide the maximum first stage thrust by the thrust to weight ratio, and this will tell us the maximum weight of the rocket. We find this comes out to 6,266,667 newtons. This is the weight. Divided by the force of gravity will give us the mass, 638,804 kilograms. Let's check and see what the margins are. Could we go up to 750,000 kilograms? 750 metric tons. Here we see what the resultant weight would be. And since the first stage engines haven't changed, we see the thrust to weight ratio drop to 1.3. 1.3 would be a little slow. That would leave us in gravity drag for quite a while. Here's the gravity drag equation. The more time you spin vertical, the higher this drag becomes. A thrust to weight ratio of 1.2 is sort of a practical minimum. On the other hand, we might think that a high thrust to weight ratio would get us out of gravity drag faster and be better, therefore making our rocket more efficient. This is true, but we also have to consider aerodynamic drag. Until we get out of the atmosphere, doubling our speed quadruples the power required. If we double our thrust to weight ratio from 1.5 to 3.0, we will blast into space like an ICBM. In fact, the Minuteman III nuclear-armed intercontinental ballistic missile has a thrust of 792,000 newtons and a weight of 323,730 newtons. This comes out to a thrust-to-weight ratio of 2.45. One problem with going to a high thrust-to-weight ratio is the stress placed on the rocket system. With a thrust to weight ratio of 1.5, we increase the force or weight in the propellant tanks by 50%. At 2, we double this stress, and at 3, we triple it. Too high of an acceleration can damage or destroy our rockets. That's why we need to throttle back as our rocket expends propellant mass. Back to the Terran R and Delta V. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky has credit for developing the rocket equation. And here it is. Delta V equals the exhaust velocity of your rocket engine times the natural log of the initial mass over the final mass. This equation, if we know the exhaust velocity of our rocket engines and the initial and final mass, will give us our delta V. Conversely, if we know the delta V, exhaust velocity, and initial mass, we can calculate the final mass. Or if we know the delta V, exhaust velocity, and final mass, we can calculate the initial mass. If we know the delta V, initial mass, and final mass, we can calculate the exhaust velocity. Now let's look back at our Terran R. If we are correct that the launch mass is around 640 metric tons, and we are told that it can get 20 metric tons to low Earth orbit, this is a mass to orbit ratio of 0.313, which means that 3.13% of our starting rocket mass ends up in orbit. It's a little better than the SpaceX Starship lifting 100 metric tons, but about the same with the new Starship goal of 150 metric tons. We couldn't find the mass of the second and first stage of the Terran R. But we know the relative mass of the Starship system first and second stage. With payload, these are here. The Starship is about 29% second stage by mass, including the payload, and 71% first stage by mass. Let's use these ratios for the Terran R and calculate our delta V. That would give the Terran R a first stage mass of almost 454 metric tons, and a second stage mass of a little more than 186 metric tons. Now let's get an estimate of dry mass. The dry mass of the Starship booster compared to its wet mass is 5%. The dry mass of the Starship second stage with payload compared to its wet mass is about 8%. We will use these in our estimates, but understand that as rockets get bigger, the dry mass, as a fraction of the wet mass, when the propellant has been loaded, usually drops just a little. Let's emphasize this point. Here is the dry mass, propellant mass, and wet mass, or gross mass, of the Saturn V RP-1 and liquid oxygen first stage. Here are the same numbers for the RP-1-fueled Antares rocket. We can see that the dry mass percentage of the Saturn V first stage is 1% lighter than the dry mass percentage of the Antares. That's pretty close. Now let's calculate our delta V. We don't know the specific impulse of the Eon-R engines or the single Eon vacuum engine. But let's use the Raptor's published values of 330 seconds and 380 seconds, respectively. That would give us exhaust velocities of 3,237 meters per second and 3,728 meters per second. We calculated that the Terran R will have a launch mass of 640,000 kilograms. We also calculated that the gross mass of the first stage 
should be about 453,703 kilograms. And multiplying that by 5% to get the dry mass of the first stage, we get 22,685 kilograms. The second stage and payload of 20,000 kilograms has a gross mass of 186,297 kilograms. Multiplied by the 8% dry mass percentage gives us 14,904 kilograms. This included the payload, so we might come out a little high. This stage burns 99% of its propellant. That means at second stage engine cutoff, or SECO, we need to have a mass of at least 36,618 kilograms. The Terran R launches with a mass of 640,000 kilograms. At first stage main engine cutoff, we would have burned 426,708 kilograms of propellant. Putting these into our delta V equation gives us a delta V contribution from the first stage at main engine cutoff of 3,557 meters per second, using our sea level exhaust of 3,237 meters per second. Now the mass of the first stage with its reserve propellant falls away to go back and land. The total mass of our second stage is 186,297 kilograms, and our final mass must be at least 36,618 kilograms, and we use our vacuum exhaust velocity of 3,728 meters per second. We get a delta V of 6,064 meters per second. Adding that to the delta V contribution of the first stage, we get a total of 9,622 meters per second. If 9,400 is enough, we're fine, but let's say we need 9,800. That would be a little less than our goal. How could we make up the difference? We only need about 178 meters per second more to get into a stable orbit, if we needed a delta V of 9,800 total. The second stage could release our satellite and go back to land. If our 20,000 kilogram satellite has a propulsion system, let's say a hypergolic kick stage, using monomethyl hydrazine and dinitrogen tetroxide, like the Draco engines on the SpaceX Dragon capsule, we could make up that difference. These engines have a vacuum specific impulse of around 300 seconds, which would give us an exhaust velocity of 2,943 meters per second. Using that exhaust velocity and knowing our starting mass, we can calculate our final mass, and we get 18,824 kilograms. That means we would only need to burn 1,176 kilograms of hypergolic MMH and NTO propellant to get to our stable orbit. We might instead decide to use an ion engine like the ones that use Krypton propellant on the SpaceX Starlink satellites. Krypton is not as good as Xenon for ion engines, but if it can get the job done, it's a lot cheaper. SpaceX uses Hall Effect thrusters, and with Krypton, these should have a specific impulse between 1,000 to 2,500 seconds. Let's go with 1,500 for this example, and see how much propellant mass that would take. A specific impulse of 1,500 seconds gives us an exhaust velocity of 14,715 meters per second. Using our modified delta V equation to calculate final mass gives us 19,759 kilograms. That means if we use Krypton Hall thrusters instead of Draco hypergolic thrusters, we would need to use only 241 kilograms of propellant instead of the 1,176 kilograms we needed before. These examples show us that for a specific rocket and propellant mass, the delta V depends on the exhaust velocity. And for a set exhaust velocity, the delta V will be determined by how much of your rocket is used as propellant. Where you can go in the solar system is determined by your delta V. Here's a delta V map. We see that it takes an average of 9,400 meters per second to get off Earth and into low Earth orbit. If we are in orbit with a comfortably equipped spaceship powered by a nuclear reactor, with high thrust efficient ion engines, where could we go? Assuming a specific impulse of 2,500 seconds. If 70% of our ship mass was propellant and the other 30% was living space, supplies, and control systems, we would have a delta V of 29,572 meters per second. And we could go anywhere, to the moon, Mercury, Venus, or Mars, with enough reserve to land on any of those or into orbit around Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, or Neptune. Though we better not try to land on these, since the first two are gas giants, and the last two are covered by massive oceans. But we could easily land on Callisto, enjoying the view for a while, before coming back home. Because we can aero break on Earth, it might only take about 700 meters per second of delta V to land, completing our first exploration of a distant world. 
something to look forward to. I hope this helps you understand Delta V a little better. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening, and stay safe. At Astra Proterra.